All right, it says going live. I might be live now, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, it says you're live. So I think we're good now. So what's up, meme team? Welcome to the live stream. Sorry for the delay. We Every time we're about to go live, we have some sort of technical issues. Um, just to make sure before we get too far into it, you guys just let me know if you guys can hear me and if you guys can see me and all that, and then we will get rolling. All right. Actually, I'm on your page, so I can see you talking, but I muted it. Good, 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 good. All right, cool. So um, you guys, welcome to the stream today. Um, today I have with me Sam Shamoon and Sean um, from Believe in Thinkers and Mixed Martial Apologetics. He's actually just helping out with the video. So um, he might be in here from time to time. But for the most part, um, welcome. We have Sam Shamoon here. Um, Sam, why don't you go ahead and tell people about yourself? Yeah. All right. Well, even before I begin, let's just praise the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we beseech the Father. For the glory of his beloved son, the Lord Jesus, the eternal word became flesh to fill us with the spirit, guide us by the spirit to speak truth without error, to glorify Jesus Christ and refute all falsehoods with the hopes that all who don't know the true God will come to know the true God and fall in love with the true Jesus, who's the God man, the eternal son. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Bless us in Jesus name. His name. Amen. Amen. I got to do that, man. I really need the Lord. We, and you know that. We all know that. Yeah, Amen. but yeah. just a little bit of background. I'm known as the most handsome Assyrian apologist on the planet. <laughs> I'm often imitated, but never duplicated, right? But no. <laughs> I, I, I've been doing apologetics since full time ministry. Let's go when I started full time. 1999, I started doing full time ministry, apologetic work related to Muslims, but in dealing with Muslims, I was forced to study the core doctrines of the Christian faith. So it wasn't just one area. When you deal with Muslims, and you know this, John, you got to know the Trinity. So they forced me to dig deep by the grace of God's spirit into the biblical basis for the Trinity, that Jesus is the God man, the Holy Spirit is a person, that these are three eternal relationships, not three modes or manifestations, why we trust the Bible, the preservation of the Bible, inspiration of the Bible. So thank God for the Muslims. I've been in full-time ministry since 1999, writing for AnsweringIslam.net, AnsweringIslam.net. And now I got a YouTube channel that I'm trying to make explode because, you know, I'm hating on you guys. Spirit of envy. I, you know, I want to catch up to you guys. <laughs> and I do a lot. And people, although they associate me with Islam, over 90% of my articles for AnsweringIslam.net and Shemunian, the sh sessions I do, focus on core doctrines of the Christian faith, such as the Trinity. So that's why... When he told me, let's address Marcus Rogers', Rogers objections to the Trinity, I was more than ready, willing, and able to do so because that's a passion for me. Hey, Amen. Cool, man. And um, you haven't seen this video, I don't think, prior to, to this, have you? I think years ago, James White critiqued it, but I didn't pay attention because unless I have to engage that, those arguments, you know, yeah. I, you know, I am, John. I'm a work yep. in progress, and your, your love for me, you're praying for me. I get really upset when I hear people denigrate the Trinity. So unless I have to, I avoid it, you know, so. Yeah, amen. But be that as me, you know. And uh, this video actually came out two months ago, so you haven't seen it. Um, and so you guys know, too, um, Sam is my boy. I, I really love this guy, and I mean that. Um, Sam is my boy. He'll always be my boy. Um, okay. I love Sam. So um, he's a great brother in the Lord and Sam's talented, understands the um, scriptures. Like he has an insane memory um, with scriptures and stuff too. That's kind of what he's known for. But Sam is, um, Sam's really dear to me. So uh, make sure you guys love on Sam. Um, so you guys know too, we're going to have, sorry if you guys hear screaming in the back. My kids always want to scream whenever I'm live. It's just what they do. <laughs> but, um, so you guys know that for the uh, super chats, we're probably going to get those at the end. So um, um, actually, Sean, watching, if you, if you can, Sean, if you can um, copy the, the Super Chats or something like that, let me know, and then we can read them all at the end. It would be awesome if you can. Um, so um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get right to it. So to start off, um, Sam, can you explain for the people watching, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? Just kind of like a basic kind of conception of it. So that way people understand before we go into answering Marcus Rogers questions. Yes. For, yeah, even the term when we say person, that needs explaining. But we believe that the one true God of the Holy Bible, the one true God whom we call Yahweh or Yahovah, eternally exists as three, for lack of a better term, eternal relationships or persons. Now, I know... There's a lot of baggage when we use the term person, but to simplify it, 
before creation, there was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three were in love with one another, in fellowship with one another, and in communion with one another. So they're not the same, what we call ego, three eternal relationships that possess the same essence of God eternally. That's what we believe, for lack of better terms, because person can miscommunicate, even though I use the term person, right? So three eternal relationships, just put that in your mind. Before creation, before anything came into being, you had the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, in love with one another, in fellowship and communion, <clears throat> inseparably existing as one God. That's what we believe. <clears throat> cool. Sounds good. And um, so you guys know, too. So um, actually, what, 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 Sean, if you're I know you're watching, Sean, can you um, your screen is actually showing in alignment with the other screens, which is fine. Um, but if you want to just have the video on a still there, you can do that if you'd like to. Um, so but anyway, so yeah, so you guys know, so Marcus Rogers is, um, if you guys don't know who he is, he's a popular YouTuber and, um, he's a oneness Pentecostal. He doesn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And a lot of people have said he's kind of changed his views on the Trinity and stuff. And I think it's just because they read a title to one of his videos where he says, Marcus Rogers changes his mind on the Trinity. I think it was a few years ago, but in reality, he still holds the same views. The video, what he was talking about is he doesn't have, um, um, he doesn't believe that Christians are necessarily or people that believe in the Trinity are necessarily going to hell and stuff like that anymore. And he believes in unity and that sort of thing, too. So that's what that's where we're kind of at with it, too. So um, the purpose of this video, though, is not to necessarily attack Marcus Rogers, but I thought it'd be a good video um, to be able to help clear up misconceptions about the Trinity so that way people can understand the Trinity better. So as Sean, I mean, as uh, Sam just articulated, um, that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And so we're going to go ahead and get into the video now. And um, so in, in the video too, I, I'm not going to play the full video because the first couple of minutes, he's just kind of talking and uh, the last couple of minutes too, we're going to conserve time. But basically what he's saying in um, before this is he's saying, these are questions that he would love for Trinitarians to ask. So I figured that we'll go ahead and respond to these because I think it does expose his misunderstanding of what the Trinity is. And uh, Marcus Rogers um, claims to be a prophet, by the way, too. And um, so a lot of people know yeah. him as a prophet, that sort of thing, too. So, so yeah. So, um, but he doesn't understand the Trinity, which is uh, problematic if you're going to reject something. You want to make sure you're rejecting what the actual doctrine is. So um, now we'll go ahead and get right to it. So we'll start with the first question. Here we go because God does not lie. All right, so check this out. The Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Would that not make the Holy Spirit the father of Jesus? So, Sean, I mean, I can't keep calling you Sean today, I can tell. Sam, what do you say to that? Yeah, uh, because again, he's a oneness. He denies the eternal sonship of Christ. So notice he's reading his view into the text. And by the way, I'm hearing this for the first time. So yep. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us to accurately <clears throat> represent what he believes and to refute what he says on the basis of scripture. He's assuming that the sonship of Christ came into being at a moment in time, specifically the virginal conception of Jesus. However, that's not what Trinitarians believe. What we believe is that Jesus has been the son before creation. What the father used the Holy Spirit to do was create the physical body and the human nature of Christ from his blessed virgin mother. But he's assuming Jesus becomes a son at conception. If the Holy Spirit is responsible for that conception, therefore he's the father of Jesus Christ. So that again shows an ignorance of the Trinity because Trinitarians do not believe that the person of Jesus <clears throat> it becomes God's son. Well, there I got to be clear too. We did have Trinitarians who believe that, like the late Walter Martin. He believed Christ was the eternal logos, but he does become the son at conception from his blessed mother. But no, the Bible is quite clear. The person of Christ has exist, existed before creation as the son of the father. He has been the father's son before creation. So what the Holy Spirit is responsible for, he's responsible for <clears throat> producing the human body, the physical nature, the physical body, the human nature of Christ. Not the person who's the son. The person of the son has been the father's son in eternity. I hope that's clear. That's right. There we go. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead. Sorry and if I sound like I'm speaking fast. It's almost I feel like I have to. So if, you know, oh, you're good, brother. So good maybe I can go a little slower. So I so I like feel like I'm pressed for time. But go ahead. No, you're good, brother. Very good. All right, let's go to the next question. Question number two: 
Where in the Bible does it say pray to the Holy Spirit? I know that it says pray in the Holy Spirit, pray with the Holy Spirit, to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But where does it say, you know, pray to the Holy Spirit like it's a separate individual? I understand that some people say they pray to the Father. Sometimes they pray to the Son. Sometimes they pray to the Holy Spirit. Um, we see this, you know, I think in the uh, Catholic religion, they pray to Mary sometimes and I believe some of the other apostles. So where in the Bible does it say to pray to the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah. See, again, this is similar to the questions that Muslims would ask. Where does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? So if we're going to restrict the Bible to speak in a certain way before we believe something, then not only will I have a problem, he'll have a problem. Because I want him to show me where does Jesus say, I am the father in the flesh in those exact words. See, anyone can play that game. Instead of imposing <clears throat> what you would like to see in the Bible, let the Bible writers express their beliefs because the Bible, number one, is not a systematic theolo <clears throat> theology book. What we have in the collection of books are inspired writings of people's interaction with God <clears throat> and their intimate communion with God. So what we do is we look at the writings as a whole and then derive our doctrine and our theology. So with that said, Though the Bible nowhere says pray to the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> which is pretty much an argument from silence, the Bible says enough about the Holy Spirit to show that he is God, he's a divine person, distinct from the Father and the Son, and if he's God, then he's worthy of all the accolades and praise that God receives, which would include prayer. And with that said, you do have prayers to the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you one. They're not as many, <clears throat> they're not as copious as we find in reference to the father and son but they're still sufficient to show that christians did pray to the holy spirit because if you go to second corinthians second corinthians <clears throat> chapter 13 verse 14 and i'm going to read that just let me get it up for you second corinthians this is a benediction paul is concluding his epistle with an invocation to god to bestow his graces and blessings on the church it's a trinitarian benediction May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. So notice, he's, he's invoking Christ to bestow his grace on believers. He's invoking God to fill their hearts with love for one another and for God. And now he's invoking the Holy Spirit to produce perfect fellowship among the members of the body of Christ. So this is what we call a benediction. And it's a prayer. And the prayer is directed to Jesus Christ. God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So that's how I'd answer him. If he's going to insist that the Bible has to speak a certain way before he believes something, that ends up proving too much because I'm going to then extend the same courtesy and say, Marcus, show me where Jesus says, I am God the Father in the flesh. Or show me somewhere in the Bible where it says, Jesus Christ is God the Father. See, two can play that game. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next question. Um, the, uh, we see in the Trinitary doctrine, doctrine it says they're co-equal, right? There are three uh, persons, personalities. Some people say persons, some people say personalities, but they're uh, all equal, right? They're, I, that's like a big strong point. They are all equal. They speak together in unity. Um, and so that's a big thing that I, I've seen a lot of people say, like they're, they're three, but they're all equal, you know, in power and authority. So why does, in John 14, Jesus say the Father is greater than me, all right? If they're all equal, why does Jesus say the Father is greater? If they're all equal, this is a separate question. Why, does not, why doesn't Jesus know the day or the hour? Mark 13, 32, he says, only my Father knows. So are they keeping information from him? Because, like, you don't have the right security clearance, so we know this, but you don't need to know this? Okay, yeah, let's, so there's, there's a couple couple of things there. So first, he starts off by saying um, that um, it's either we believe in different persons or different personalities. Uh, Trinitarians believe in different persons, not different personalities, right? I, I don't know where he got that from. Uh, but then he goes on to quote from John 14, says, Jesus is greater than me. Then he goes on next to say um, where he quotes, um, actually, what passage was it? I just forgot already. Yeah, he quote, he's referring, he was alluding to Mark 13, 32, which is also Matthew 24, 36. He didn't mention the reference. At least I didn't hear him. 
but I know what he's referring to where it says at the day hour, no man knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father alone. That's Mark 13, 32. So I have, I, I know the, yeah. the reason why, and again, John, you can confirm, right? This is my first time hearing this. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. And you see my reaction because if I didn't know any better, this was a Muslim or a Jehovah witness yep. trying to object to the Trinity because it's the same typical objections against the Trinity. So you let That's me know right. which one you want me to tackle first, because this is like, you're giving me curveballs here, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start with the, the, um, the John 14 passage. Now it's ironic. Now he claims to believe in the Bible and that he's quote unquote, a certain type of <clears throat> Christian. <clears throat> I'd like to extend that objection to him real quickly. I would say, well, if Jesus, because I still don't know what type of modalism he embraces. Yeah. If he types, if he invite, if he, believes in a type of modalism where Jesus is the human manifestation of the father. That makes no sense. So is Jesus saying he's greater than himself in his view? What is, what does, how does he yeah. address that as a modalist, right? Yeah, I actually, that's exactly what I was thinking. Actually in his talk with Stephen Bankars, he says that he believes uh, that God, the father put on, I, I, I want to say he, yeah, it's a modalist view. He put on the flesh and he became the son, so uh, then but it's Jesus, a modalist view in his view of Stephen Bancar. I'm not sure if he changed his view on that, but that's how it was when he argued with him. Well, John, you know what he basically believes, right? That Jesus is saying, I'm greater than myself. I'm greater right. than my human manifestation. Does that's that right. make sense? So yeah. I can turn it against him. But from the Trinitarian perspective, and I've done sessions on this and I've written articles on this, but again, I don't want to rush through it, but not belabor the point because there are other points we want to address by the grace of the trying God. When Jesus says, and I'll read it, it's John 14, 28. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming. I'm, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, immediately there, Jesus says, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father for this reason. I'm going to the Father for this reason. The Father is greater than I. We will see the significance of that in a minute, but I want to address the word greater. The word greater in English, just like the Greek word greater, <clears throat> right, my zone, can mean that you're greater in position or rank, or you're better than me in essence and nature. So is Jesus saying the father is greater in the sense that he's better than me because his essence is superior to mine because I'm just a creature and I'm infinitely less than him? Or is he saying the father is greater than me in position rank by virtue of my status on earth? Because don't forget, all the gospels and the New Testament as a whole emphatically emphasize, teach, that when Jesus came to the earth, he took the status of a servant to be his father's servant slash slave. So on earth, he had set aside his divine glory, the glory that he possessed in heaven, that visible glory that was manifested to the inhabitants of, of heaven. When the angels saw him, they knew they were looking at God. That, that glory he set aside, he veiled it by human flesh, and he was functioning in the status of a servant. Now, how do I know that's what Jesus means? The Father is greater than me in rank, not in essence. Because if we just go a little earlier into the context and read, I'm going to go to John 14, 12 to 14. John 12, uh, 14, <clears throat> same chapter, <clears throat> verses 12 to 14. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they will do even greater works than these. Same word, my zone greater works than these because I'm going to the father. So let me just unpack it real quickly. Jesus is saying, you see the works I've been doing on earth, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, cleansing lepers, <clears throat> also feeding those who are hungry and <clears throat> preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You guys are going to be doing all of that. You're going to be doing the same works, but greater works than these. Obviously, Jesus is not saying that their works are going to be better in quality. It's the same kind of works, but a greater number of them. So right there, we see that greater doesn't mean greater in essence, in quality, but a greater volume, more. Because historically, as the book of Acts and history testifies, the apostles reached more people and went to more places than Jesus did. So just on historical grounds, this is true. They did more miracles because they went to more places and they ministered for a longer period than Jesus did. So it's the same kind of works, but a greater number of them. But here's where it gets astonishing. Jesus explains why they'll be doing a greater number of works than him, because I'm going to the Father. Well, what's the connection? Jesus, what's the connection with 
you going to the Father and them doing a greater number of the same works you were doing on earth? Here's the, here's the answer, 13 and 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, John, I wasn't born yesterday. <clears throat> I was born the day before and I, I had a hard time in kindergarten. I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. But my question to you is this, what kind of attributes or characteristics must Jesus possess to be able from heaven hear all the prayers and the request of his emissaries on earth to do the miracles from heaven through them? Because Jesus says, I will do the works. It's not you doing the works. I will do the works for you when I return to the Father in heaven, and I will answer your prayers and empower you from heaven to do all these miraculous deeds. What kind of attributes must Jesus have? Divine. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So wait. <laughs> You mean the same chapter, John, Jesus confirms that he is omniscient because he has to know how many are asking him and what they're asking for. And he has to be omnipresent because he has to be personally with them to empower them. And he must be omnipotent. He must have the power, enough power to answer all their requests at the same time. So clearly Jesus is saying he is God in the fullest sense. Well, if he's God in the fullest sense, he cannot be inferior to the Father in essence. That's right. One more passage, so because I don't want to belabor the point, but I still want to bring up the contextual meaning. John 14, 23. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we, Father and I, together will come to him and make our home with them. So again, I want to know. Jesus is saying, whoever truly loves me will keep my word. And if he keeps my word, my father and I will come and dwell with him personally and intimately. So, John, Jesus is claiming that he will be present to the same extent, to the same sense that the father is with every believer that loves him? That's right. That sure sounds like they're essentially equal, right? That's right. So yeah. then, and, so, and from the modalist perspective, from, the, uh, for our, from, from his perspective, he would say, well, of course, we believe that Jesus is fully God. Um, you know, no. so... so yeah, I know exactly. So, so what do you say to that? Because I'm sure that's what you would say. Because according to this is the human Jesus claiming to be present to the same extent that the divine father is, right? Because remember, Jesus is human. Right. Right. So now he's, he's in a conundrum. How can a merely human Jesus be omnipresent? Because he didn't say the father would be with you. We will be with you. So you have a human Jesus who's just as divine as the divine father. That's idolatry. That's blasphemy. There we go. There we right? go. Yep. So have we established that according to John 14, 28, it's not greater in essence, but in position and rank. And that's why right. you should be happy. I'm going to the, to the father. Well, why should you be happy? Because his point is, if I remain on earth, he'll be greater in status. But if I go back, that will change. And that's where John 17 verse five comes in. And John 17 verse five, Jesus says, and now father, glorify, glorify me together with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. But according That's to right. Marcus, there was no Jesus that was there before the world was created, existing alongside the Father in the same glory, because the man Jesus only came into being when he was created by the Spirit in his mother's womb. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll get that later, because I would think that John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14 and 1.18 all have to, and even you have Philippians 2.17, all these would have to destroy that sort of view, right? They'd either right. have to be false or whatnot, but we'll get into that later. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the next question so we can keep up. So next question. All right. If they always speak in, um, in unity, why did Jesus say, um, let this cup pass for me? And also when he was praying, why did he pray to the father and not the Holy Spirit? Did the Holy Spirit's opinion not matter? Because when he prayed, he said, let this. So first of all, was his will was not lined up with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Because you guys say they're all, you know, they speak as one. They're in unity. They share the same will, all that kind of stuff. So was he in rebellion to the Father and the Holy Spirit because his will at the time did not line up? He was saying, let this cup pass for me. I don't want to. And then not only that, in the prayer, he didn't even acknowledge the Holy Spirit. He only prayed to the Father. But you guys say they all, you know, communicate together. 
All right, what do you okay. say about that, Sam? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I'm really baffled because these questions are problematic for his position, not ours, because after all, Jesus is simply the human nature of the Father, right? That's right. So you mean the human, fast, human manifestation of the Father <clears throat> wasn't in line with the Father. So the Father, in another mode, wasn't in line with himself, according to his logic, right? Yeah, that's what he's saying. That's I mean, what have to say, remember, yeah. he's trying to put us in, in a predicament in which he thinks that we don't have answers to these questions. But before yeah. I answer, I want to show you can turn it against him. So wait, Marcus, Jesus is the human nature of the Father. How does the human nature of the Father have a will that doesn't align with the Father's will when Jesus is simply the Father in different mode? Does that make sense? No. And who is Jesus praying to? I thought he is the Father. So is this like... A schizophrenic deity or van you know what, what is who jesus is the human nature of the father how so according to you marcus jesus is praying to himself and his will is not in line with his will because this is simply the the father in different mode and in that mode the father can have a conflicting will with himself so that the father is at war with himself so i can turn this against him more forcefully but yeah. coming back coming back to our position this is easily answerable I guess he has a weird understanding of what unity means. Unity doesn't mean that they are not distinct persons who interact with one another and have fellowship with one another. All this proves is that Jesus is not the same person as the Father. And Jesus' prayer isn't an indication that Jesus somehow is in rebellion, because if you actually understand the context and what Jesus is saying, Jesus is asking the Father to remove this cup, the cup of judgment. Why? Because Jesus, the Son has to experience in a moment of time the judgment of God on our behalf, something he dreads more than anything because Jesus is in love with the Father and the Spirit and cannot fathom for a second that that intimate communion between the three persons would have to be sev temporarily severed so that he could be punished in our place. And if you actually read it in context, it's not that he's in rebellion to the Father because he says, not my will, your will be done, showing that Jesus is in perfect union with the Father. He never <clears throat> does something independently from the Father. He's not a renegade, rebellious son, challenging the Father, but lovingly he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, yet not my will, your will be done. So all that proves is they're not the same person, which is exactly what Trinitarianism teaches. And secondly, it actually shows that the Son is in perfect union with the Father because the Son is not saying, Take this cup away from me, otherwise, or else. If it's within your will that I don't have to go through this because I don't want to experience the judgment that's about to come upon me as their substitute because of my deep love for you and the Spirit, then remove this cup. Nevertheless, I'm not insisting your will be done. So that's easily answerable. Now, why didn't he pray, pray to the Holy Spirit? Because he didn't come to fulfill the Spirit's will. He came to fulfill the Father's will. And the Spirit was there with him, empowering him, working alongside of him, in union with him, to carry out the Father's will. Because Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And who sent me? God the Father. So why should he pray to the Spirit when it's the Father that he came to serve and accomplish his will perfectly on earth? That's right. Problem? Yeah, and that, that's a big thing, right? Because over and over, you'll see too in this video that he seems to think that unity means that there's there's no um, availability for distinctions. And so because he can't make distinctions, he, he keeps coming to these weird conclusions. But on top of it, kind of like you alluded to earlier, it's like with even on his doctrine, he has even further problems, right? And that's the thing, guys, we're not just, it's not like Christians sat together and they said, how can we make up a, a doctrine that's hard to wrap your mind around? Let's just say the Trinity, right? No, the Bible actually gives us this view. And that's why Christians hold the view of the Trinity is because it's explicit in the Bible. Yes. But um, yeah, let's go ahead and go to the next question. In Matthew 28, why does it say name instead of names? When the Bible said, when uh, Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's one name, a singular name, okay? Where in the Bible, different question. Where it cut off for me. Uh, no, that it was supposed to stop there. Okay. Um, did you hear yeah, the question? Uh, his assumption, again, is if that if you have more than one person possessing the same name, then they can't be different persons. 
that assumption is refuted by the Bible itself. You can have more than one person that possess a common name to denote a common essence they share. Let me repeat that slowly because it almost feels like my time's going to run out. So let me take it no, slow. I want to make sure people get this, right? Because this is me, yeah. right? And we want to make sure they get it so they can see why modalism is an unbiblical, damnable heresy. And the only doctrine that you can derive from scripture is the triunity of God. Now, assumption, notice the assumption there. One name means they have to be one person in three different modes. No, because I'm going to read Genesis 5 verses 1 to 2. Genesis 5 verses 1 to 2. And guys, don't take my word for it. Go read Hebrew. If you can read the Hebrew, get you an interlinear or look at the lexicon and you're going to see this is what it says. This is the written account, the generations of Adam. When God created Adam, the Hebrew word is Adam. He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them Adam when they were created. Now, John, uh, I'm a little confused here. It says when God created male and female, he named them. He gave both of them the name Adam. So the male was Adam and Eve was Adam. So if I apply his logic, that means Eve could not be the wife of Adam because they possess the same name. Therefore, they must be the same person. So who did... Adam Mary, he married himself? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Do you see the silliness of that objection? So let me repeat so people get it. It is not a biblical argument to say, if you possess the same name that someone else shares, that means you're the same person. No. <clears throat> a common name denotes an essence that you possess in common or a shared authority. The reason why male and female are called Adam, it's not because they're the same person. They're not. They're distinct persons that come together in union. A perfect illustration or an excellent illustration on a very limited temporal finite level of the Godhead being more than one person in fellowship with one another, possessing a common essence. Common name means you possess a common essence and or authority. So the reason why it's the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, not because they're one person. It's because they possess a common essence. All three are equally God, though they're not the same person. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. All right. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and go to the next question. Holy Spirit. The answer is not Matthew 28. That was Jesus telling them how to uh, baptize. And nobody was baptized in Matthew 28. So from that point on, every time somebody was baptized, they baptized them in the name of Jesus. So when he says, let us ba uh, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the apostles went and baptized in the name of Jesus. Nobody got baptized, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, anywhere in the Bible. Some people have argued with me. They said, well, the apostles did it wrong. Like I said, the Bible can't contradict them, contradict itself. So did you notice how he first quoted Jesus, right? Um, and, and then he would say, so he quoted Jesus and then he switched it over to something Jesus didn't say. And then he treated Jesus's quote as metaphorical in some sense, and then switched it over to um, the making the other one literal, you, are, you know, when people are baptized in an ax and literal too. Um, so anyways, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you basically answered it. I challenge him and any oneness modalist to show me that was the baptismal formula they use when they immerse someone in water. And they dip someone in in the name of Jesus Christ. And even in the book of Acts, it's not a baptismal formula. It's simply a command saying, do this for the sake of Jesus. By the authority of Jesus, we command you, if you believe in him, that you do it for his sake. That's all it's saying. So I challenge, and here's my challenge, open challenge to any modalist. Show me that this is the precise formula they uttered when they dipped the, the, the one being baptized in water. No, you won't find it. It's not there. So why did they say in the name of Jesus? That's simply their way of saying it is by the authority of the risen Christ that we command you to observe this. Do it for his sake if you believe he is Lord. Get baptized by the authority of Christ because Christ commands it. He authorizes us to impose this command on you if you believe he is Lord and you're willing to submit to him. But it's not a baptismal formula. I challenge them to show me that's the words they uttered verbally when they immerse someone in water. Can they do that? Nah, can't. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Um, who was speaking to Abraham and Jonah when the Bible says the word of the Lord came to them, right? When, when the word of the Lord came to Abraham and Jonah, 
um, Saul on the Damascus road. Uh, when the uh, Moses was talking to the burning bush, I know the angel was there, but then the voice said, I am what I am. What was that voice? All right. Do you believe that um, it was one voice? Just like there was one name, there was one voice. It says the word of the Lord. Who is the Lord? Right. He, uh, uh, what was it? Saul looked up and, and it was the Lord speaking to him. And all these occasions, the Lord was speaking. Who is the Lord? Is the Lord, as you guys say, the voice of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit speaking as one in that one voice? Or was it the Father speaking? Some people say, oh, it was the Holy Spirit speaking through the burning bush, or it was the Son speaking or the Father speaking. Um, yeah, that was, uh, John, I'm really disappointed at the level of argumentation because he just refuted modalism and proved the eternal personhood of the word before he became flesh. I mean, did you hear what he just said to you, John? He just said, no, how, how do you do that? Because he said, the word of the Lord came to Abraham and Jonah and said, notice the word of the Lord came speaking. That's our entire point. Jesus is the eternal word of the father who would appear to the prophets and the patriarchs and speak to them on the father's behalf. Because notice what John 1, 1 said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then he became flesh. So it's ironic he quotes a passage to show the personal existence of the word already active in the Old Testament before he became flesh, which means that already in the Old Testament, you have a personal distinction in the Godhead, thereby refuting modalism. And he doesn't see it. Right. So to, so to answer the question, that's Jesus in his pre-human existence yeah. as someone yeah. distinct from the Father. And that's what we believe. Jesus is the eternal word. He's always been with the Father and the Spirit. He's always been the one that the Father sent with the Spirit to make God known. That was Jesus speaking to Abraham, Jesus speaking to Jonah, Jesus speaking to Moses, and not simply the Father manifesting as the Word, but the Word as a distinct divine person who's the agent of the Father, operative in the Old Testament, who then became the flesh and blood Jesus Christ. That actually, I, I'm going to be politically incorrect, decimates modalism. I don't yeah. know why I would bring it up. <laughs> That's right. And um, if we got some time here towards the end too, maybe we'll do uh, like a one or two points maybe on the Trinity in the Old Testament as well too. Sure. A lot of people aren't aware of that as well too. And, so, and by the uh, way, just to let, let, let everyone know, our partner in ministry, Anthony Rogers, is a beast when it comes to the Trinity in the Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Like looking like a beast, he is a beast, but that's another thing. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Let's see. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? I have. I was talking to a, a Trinitarian um, brother, and he said, "Well, it means you know, t uh, fingers and toes and things." And so I asked him. I said, uh, "Well, why did in John one he says God wrapped Himself in flesh? You know, and um, the Bible says that God is a spirit, right? So if we're made in the image of God, and God isn't sitting up there looking like this because He's a spirit, what does that mean?" And if we look at how we're actually made, I have a soul, I have a spirit, and I have a fleshly body, but I am one person. My soul is not over here. My spirit is not over here. I'm made in the image of God, and all three are one. And when I die, my soul can leave my body the same way that the Holy Spirit can uh, come out from God, right, and we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and before we re respond to those real quick, um, notice too, like, um, and this is the thing too, like, um, Marcus, if you're watching, uh, you gotta try to learn what you know about the Trinity. Okay, for example, when you say that you talk to a guy who's a, a Trinitarian who said, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And he has hands and fingers and toes or whatever. That's a, that's a, a view on Mormonism. That's not a, a Christian view for one. And so, um, and two, it has nothing to do with the Trinity in that sense too. And so that's why it's like, get your facts, not from um, these kind of random people or something like that. If, if you wanna understand the Trinity, you gotta actually just do the work to read the books on it. There's countless books on it. And all these questions that you're asking, they've been refuted and answered. I mean, I mean how many times, right? In clear and concise ways too. So, um, but anyways, I'm sure you probably disagree, but anyways, want to point that out there. So now Sam, what say yeah, you? John, I'm almost thinking that this is like a setup. We paid him to make it so easy <laughs> to refute modalism. And for the record, I want everyone, we haven't paid him. Oh, wait, before you go there, uh, for people that don't understand what modalism is, can you just explain to them modalism? Yeah, well, see, that's what there's a variety of right. flavors in modalism, but modalism basically means there's one divine person 
who will manifest in different modes in different ways. And he gave the example. For example, John is a father. John is a brother. He's a son. He's a husband. But he's still one person. So the father is the father and can take on the mode of the son and then take on the mode of the Holy Spirit. It's manifestations, roles, modes of one person, not three different persons and separately united in one essence, right? Yep, there we go. Okay, now back to it. If now, you can the reason why I'm saying this, it's almost like someone paid Marcus to say, hey, make it easy for them to prove the Trinity by asking the right questions to demolish modalism. Genesis 126, 27, folks, and I want you to pay attention. This is a nightmare for modalism because it proves the opposite. It proves that God is not a singular person because I want to unpack this. Now, let me show you why I say this. I, and I was shocked when he mentioned it. I said, no, this can't be real. This has got to be. This is like God, you know, anyway, let me read what it says. Then God said, let us make Adam in our image, in our likeness, so that, <clears throat> well, hold on one second. I'm, you know, I do love the NIV, but sometimes it makes it harder for me because it does take liberties with translating to, <clears throat> you know, paraphrase more than literal here. Let me use the English Standard Version for you Calvinists. Then God said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, before I move on, pay attention to two things. This is the first time in the narrative, folks, that God switches the way he creates, switches the way he speaks and in bringing creation into being. Up until that point, God kept saying, let there be light. There was light. Let there be this. There was that. All of a sudden, when he comes to create mankind, he changes his language and he speaks in the plural. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And here's where people don't catch it, where they read it too quickly to see the import of this passage, why it's a Trinitarian blessing, a blessing from heaven, <clears throat> laying the foundation for the Trinity, but an anti-Trinitarian nightmare. Let them have dominion over the fish, them. So notice, God says, we are going to create Adam, and Adam is a them. Adam is them that rule creation, not a him. He's not one person. So contrary to what he said, the Adam that God created in his likeness is more than one person that possesses a common essence. And this is confirmed in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Oh, wow. Adam is a them. Adam is a him and a them. And he's male and female. So the one Adam, the one him, is male and female. And together, they are them. So in this passage, God illustrates the plurality within unity of the Godhead by saying, I'm going to create Adam as a finite temporal reflection of my being. Adam, though one, is more than one person, male and female. Together, they will rule physical creation, and the two are linked by a common essence, and they're in fellowship with one another. So now notice the irony. The creation of Adam, consisting of more than one person, male and female, sharing a common essence, that are in fellowship with one another, is supposed to be a reflection of God. So God, like Adam, but on an infinitely higher level, is a community of more than one person that possess a common essence. And these persons are in fellowship with one another, which is why God says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. So this very example proves the opposite point. The one Adam is male and female, more than one person, sharing a common essence in fellowship as a reflection that the one God is more than one person, that possess a common essence, and they too are in fellowship with one another. How does this prove modalism? Good. Yeah, no idea. Good points. Hey, really good points. And so you guys know, too, we got a super chat, a couple super chats. You guys will be reading those at the end. Um, Benjamin, if you can resend your comment, um, because I didn't see your comment, um, but I did see the other ones. We'll read those at the end of this, too, after we get through the video, and then we'll go through the questions and the super chats. Um, okay, so now uh, that was an excellent, excellent point, too. So now let's go over to uh, the next question. What spirit moved across the earth in Genesis in the beginning when the spirit of, of God moved? So the Bible says that God is a spirit, right? And the spirit is moving across the earth. 
moving across the water. Does that mean that if God is a spirit and there's the Holy Spirit, when you get to heaven, is there going to be the spirit of God, the son and the Holy Spirit? Are there two spirits? Is it one spirit? Was the Holy Spirit moving across the earth? All right. That's just a, another question. Yeah. Uh, like I said, man, these are too easy. And I hope they'll get a little more challenging to make us really think and stretch. But this is too easy to refute, especially when he says, who are we going to see in heaven? I, I have a surprise for Marcus, because the Bible says that all three persons of the Godhead appear visibly and believers get a glimpse of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit appearing in a visible form where they can see they're distinct from one another. But let me answer the question. He actually misinterprets John 4, 24, because he says the Father is a spirit. And therefore, if the Father is in a spirit, the spirit and the Holy Spirit is the spirit, what are they, two spirits? Well, let me correct that. Number one, if he means by spirit, two spirits, that they're two different persons, they are two different persons. If he means by two spirits that they're distinct beings that possess different essences, essences then no, because John 4, 24 is simply saying that the Father is spirit by nature. His nature is spirit, and that needs a little unpacking. That's why I don't want to take too much time, but not rush through this. If you actually read the context, what Jesus is saying to the Samaritan woman, because that's the context. Jesus is saying to the Samaritan woman that you won't need to worship God on this mountain or in Jerusalem because God is spirit, and you have access to him wherever you go. So I want people to understand what the context is of that statement in John 4.24. Because the Samaritan is asking Jesus, our fathers worship God on this mountain. But you Jews say that you got to worship in Jerusalem. So who's right? And he says, it doesn't matter where you worship. Why? Because God is spirit. What does he mean by spirit? God is not a material, physical, time-bound being so that he is bound to time, space, and place. And you got to find the exact location in order for God to have fellowship with you. What Jesus meant is God is spirit in the sense that he's timeless. He's immaterial, spaceless, and placeless. And therefore, no matter where you're at, you have access to God because he's omnipresent. So when he says God, the Father, Spirit, he means his nature is such that he is not bound to time, space, or place. He's invisible, incorporeal, spaceless. So don't worry about where you're at. Wherever you're at, you have access to him. And if you're going to define spirit in that sense, that God's nature is spirit, well, that is also the nature of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is spirit by nature. The Son is spirit by nature. The Holy Spirit is spirit by nature because they possess the same essence. That essence is the essence of God. And God's essence is to be spirit in that sense. Now, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Was I clear, John, so far? Yeah, yeah. No, that was great. Yeah. Okay. Now, good. here's what's ironic. He again quotes a passage that refutes him. Genesis 1, verses, verse 2. Let me read it. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, for a modalist, I don't know why he'd bring this up, because you have two entities here. You have Ruach, and you have Elohim. Ruach Elohim. You have Elohim and his Ruach. Last time I checked, if I say the Spirit of such and such, that implies two distinct entities. God and his Spirit. Now that this Spirit is personal, so note what Genesis 1 tells us. God possesses a spirit, the spirit of God. So in some sense, that spirit is distinct from God. But this spirit is not simply God's power or force. He's a person. Now, how do I know that? Because of the verb hovering. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. If you look at that verb hovering, it appears only one other time in the Pentateuch, the Torah. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, where it talks about an eagle hovering over her nest to take care of her young, her younglings. Now notice the verb there. In Deuteronomy 32, 11, it's used for the activity of an eagle, an eagle that's, that has cognition, an eagle that is aware that she has youngs that need to be provided for and taken care of. So this eagle is pr protecting, nurturing, and providing for her youngs. Well, now, when you take that verb and apply it to the spirit, here we see that the verb is used for personal activity, an activity that someone who has cognition, awareness, engages in. And what's the activity? 
It is the spirit who overs the prebiotic earth, because this is the earth in its prebiotic state, in order to give it life and make it habitable. In other words, this is an, ac an action that presupposes the personhood of the spirit. The, the spirit is involved in a personal action, an action carried out by an intelligent mind, not simply an active force. So right there, that shows the spirit is a person in union with God. That's further confirmed in Genesis 1.26. Because who is God speaking to when he says, let us make man in our image? He was talking to the spirit. He was saying to the spirit, you and I together will make man in our image. Now, further confirmation that God is speaking to the spirit, proving the spirit is distinct from God and a divine person. How do I know he's divine? Because he is creating man and making the earth habitable, which are functions of the creator. So you have God and his spirit together creating and giving life, showing that God and his spirit together are the creator of all creation. Further confirmation of this, John, Job 33, verse 4. Remember, spirit of God hovering over the watery deep of the earth. God said, let us make man. Job 33, verse 4, ties this all in together. The spirit of God has made me. Let us make man. The Spirit of God has made me. The Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Here, Job combines the teaching of Genesis to show us that when God was speaking and said, let us make man, he was talking to the Spirit of God, his spirit, showing the Spirit is a person that God speaks with and personally involved in the making of man. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. What else do you need to show that the Old Testament is thoroughly Trinitarian? That's... Great. <laughs> All right, great points there. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next question, and then we may, um, well, let's, let's see how it goes. Let's go to the next question. Here's a couple bonus questions. If you guys, you know, feel like you just really want to answer these. A lot of your beliefs, very similar to Catholics, right? So Catholics believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they baptize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You guys have a lot of similarities. Do you believe that Catholics are saved? Do you believe that because they agree with the revelation that you have about the Father and Son, Holy Spirit, that they believe in the true God? And my final question. Make it pause. Uh, bonus. All right. So, um, okay. But so the question there, okay, I'm trying to think of what has to do with the Trinity. So he's saying that. Um, we have similar views to the Catholics because they pray in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Therefore, are Catholics saved? Is, is that the, the argument? He's, he's assuming that you and I come from a perspective where we think no Catholic is saved. Oh, and gosh. I don't believe that. And I know you don't believe that, right? I, no. mean, I don't want to speak presumptuously for you. I mean, but right? Right. Okay, but let, let's, let's play that out. L look at the inconsistency. But wait, Marcus, you also believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but you believe it in a different way. You believe they're their modes of the same person, but you still say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Moreover, last time I checked, Marcus believes in the virginal conception and birth of Jesus Christ. So do Catholics. Marcus right. believes that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So do Catholics. Marcus believes, I think he believes this. I mean, I don't think he's that, he would deny that Jesus was raised physically bodily. So do Catholics. Marcus believes that Jesus went to heaven in his glorified physical body. So do Catholics. Marcus believes that Jesus will return physically bodily to judge the living and the dead. So do Catholics. By golly, because Catholics believe it, therefore it's false. Therefore, Marcus cannot be a true Christian because he's a Catholic in disguise. You see how silly that objection is? Yep. Yeah, bad. And so you guys know too, um, so um, like we, and we said, for those of you that are just tuning in, Marcus Rogers is a popular YouTuber. He's got over 300,000 subscribers and um, he, um, he says he's a prophet. He believes he's a prophet and he um, um, is a Unitarian where he doesn't believe in the, the, the Trinity. Um, he grew up one, one that's Pentecostal too. So I know that's where obviously he gets a lot of his views. Um, but when it comes to, I mean, even going through these questions, there's a lot of theological, like complete like misunderstandings like um and and even when it comes to understanding what the trinity is that he rejects he just doesn't seem to understand what christians actually believe about the trinity um and so when he's rejecting this to me it's like if you're going to reject something you got to understand what it is and for him to ask these questions shows me that he just doesn't understand what the trinity is or what it teaches um so anyways i just wanted to make sure that that was clear john one thing to add 
the yep. Catholics also accept the 27 books of the New Testament as inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. When I say Catholics, the, the ones that are conservative, not the liberals, because we also have liberal Protestants. So that means he should reject the 27 books of the New Testament. Therefore, he needs to find another religion. Yeah, that's that guilty by association fallacy, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, which is bad. So, um, okay, guys, so we'll go ahead and get into question and answers here now. Um, so you guys can send your questions. Um, we'll do Q&A. Um, and then let me now go back. I'm try I try to screenshot some of the uh, super chats. So that way I can make sure that i um, not miss them. So um, we'll start with those. Let me go to my photos now. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, first super chat was, for, yeah, uh, it's from, um, search for truth. His first one I saw, um, this one is to you, Sam. It says, I accept your challenge about baptism in Jesus's name and acts 238, 10, 48 and 22, 16. The Greeks suggest that the name of Jesus was invoked at baptism. Uh, Absolutely. James two, seven confirms this no Trinitarian formula. Yeah, say? absolutely not. Because what he's telling me is that he's having them get baptized as a recognition that they acknowledge Jesus as Lordship because they had crucified Christ. Because read Acts 2, 37. But then further read on when they got baptized, where was the formula uttered? I'm aware of these passages. I guess he thinks yeah. I'm speaking in ignorance that I'm not aware. For example, I'll even quote Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive <clears throat> the gift of the Holy Spirit. Keep reading on. When they do, they actually do get baptized, what formula was pronounced over them? Nothing. So why is he saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, into the name of Jesus Christ? Because Paul, Peter, not Paul, I'm sorry, Peter had just indicted them for instigating the crucifixion of death of Jesus. Because he said, if you go to Acts 2.36, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. So what he's saying is, now acknowledge your sin and error, by getting baptized as a recognition that you believe that Jesus is Lord, he is risen, and that you wrongly condemned him to die. That's all the formula is saying. But so he failed miserably to show me that when they did get baptized, keep reading, keep reading. When they did get baptized, that they pronounced the name of Jesus only to the exclusion of the Father and the Spirit. You won't find it. It doesn't exist. That is what we call abysmal failure. See, and, and here's the thing, too, is a lot of people, I think we all tend to naturally have some inclination towards this, is that like, even like with the James 14, I mean, the John 14 passage, um, too, when it's like the father's greater than God, when people read the context, it makes it more clear what's going on. But a lot of people, we, we like to just like pull out a single verse, exclude it from his context and think that it proves something, you know what I mean? So uh, something to watch. Uh, thanks for the super chat from C Punish One. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, super chat from Jodink One. Uh, says, God bless you, John and Sam. Keep up the good work, serving the Lord and piercing the darkness. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, looks like um, <clears throat> the loser from Act 17 Apologetic says, when Sham Shamoon is on, it's not a live stream. It's a lame stream. <laughs> Listen, my back is given up from carrying all that weight, David. You need to start carrying your own load. I can't do it anymore, bro. I'm getting... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, super chat from Jojo Momster. Thank you very much for the super chat. Pre appreciate it. Um, and so you guys don't, don't know too, um, Sam knows. Uh, so the same way he has all these passages in his head memorized with the Bible, he's like the same with all of these like gazillion hadiths and stuff too in like the Islam and the Quran and everything too. It's like insane. Um, so God definitely blessed him with a uh, beautiful mind. Yeah. Absolutely. And I remember you told me when we talked about this, when we first met, you said that like, you realize you can just start memorizing or you just could remember these passages easy, right? Yeah, they just come to my mind. So I'm talking to you and then the verses just pop in my mind. I, I know people may think it's weird or I'm like, is that, no, that's what happens. The yeah. verse, I see, actually see the letter, like say, I'll see John, the word, and I'll see the verse. Yeah, that's, that's insane. I wish I had that mind, man. I'd be way smarter <laughs> if I could. Um, super chat from Caramel Crunk. What's up? Good to see you. Good to read from you. Says, um, how does Sam address oneness Pentecostals when they say Jesus was called the father in Isaiah 9, 6? Just let me highly encourage everyone. Go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I have an entire article on that. Now, let me explain that. I have an article on this. If you actually look at the Hebrew, it says that the child who will be born, this is Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, and then most translations will say Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And again, don't take my word for it. 
if you can read the Hebrew, go read the Hebrew, get any lexical source or even a commentary. It's actually Aviad, literally the father of, I don't like to use the word eternity because eternity may miscommunicate that somehow we will live timelessly. And I don't know, I think John, you'd agree with me philosophically that we're creatures. So we'll experience never ending time and only God by nature is timeless. I don't know, but that's right. Yeah. Okay, so you agree? Okay, good, man. Yep, See, I know yep. you, man, I knew you're a genius, bro, because you agree <laughs> with everything I believe. <laughs> okay. But literally, the term is father of everlastingness. What it's saying is, if you check actually how the word father is used in the Hebrew scriptures, it can mean possessor or source of. Literally, it's saying that this child is the father of everlastingness. <clears throat> and then you see this word odd used, and this is all my article. It's used in Isaiah 57, 15 where it talks about Yahovah inhabiting Ad. He inhabits Ad. Some translations say he inhabits eternity, but others will say he who lives forever. So right there, it tells you what it means. It refers to something that's never ending, that continues forever. Literally, it's simply saying that this child is the possessor of everlasting life, and he confers everlasting life on all who trust in him, because in him is life. That's exactly the New Testament teaching. John 1, 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So all it's saying is that this child possesses everlastingness as a quality, meaning everlasting life, and he confers it on all who turn to him. It's not saying he's God the Father. It's saying he's the possessor of eternal life, a life he bestows on all who turn to him. No more, no less. That's all it's saying. Amen. Um, hey, so the uh, search for truth, the same person who um, said he took you up on your challenge, he sent another one saying, sorry, that was a failed answer to my points. Yeah. You, did, <laughs> you didn't address the Greek in 238, 1048, 22, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought so in context. Yep. In fact, here, I want to see how much he knows the Greek. Can he confirm to everyone that the Greek preposition is not the same in every place that the formula be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Can he confirm that? Or do I have to school him on that? Because he's trying to school me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we may have to school him, but there's one more point he yeah. said. He said, um, nor did you address James 2.7. And why would I need to James James 2.7? I, I was thinking, I was trying to picture that in my mind because that's yeah, what, where he's talking James about the favoritism, right? That's what? about the name? I don't, I don't understand what he's trying to get at. Is he saying the name in James 2.7 means that the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit happens to be Jesus? But obviously, but... When they invoke the name, it's not so much that the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son is Jesus. Holy Spirit, that's the name they share in common. In biblical usage, when you speak of the name, you're talking about the person that has authority over you and that you submit to and entrust your life to as Lord. That's all it means. In fact, if you go to James 1.1, 1, 1, James says that he's a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in James 2.1, he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, the glory. So again, I think he's thinking name in the sense like, hey, my name is Tom. The Bible uses the term name in a variety of ways. It can invoke a person's characteristics or the authority that a person has over your life so that you submit to that authority. Okay. That's right. That's right. Very okay. good. Cool. Um, yeah. And um, th uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, Cheryl R. Thank you very much. Appreciate it from the super sticker. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, not, how no. desperate must they be that this is their strongest text is to point to passages in Acts to show that it's one person who has his name, Jesus. I mean, is that the entire foundation of your theology? The passages in Acts where they supposedly baptize with the formula in the name of Jesus to prove that the Father is Jesus, the Son is Jesus, Holy Spirit is Jesus. So let's just focus on those scanty few references and ignore what the Bible teaches as a whole. And voila, we're modalists. Talk about yeah. desperate and weak. Yeah, see, and, and I noticed too with a lot of um, uh, modalists who are kind of a lot of oneness, is, um, th there's a trouble sometimes in just making simple kind of distinctions. And, and I think that that's why I wanted to do this live stream because it's, it's more of a way for people to understand the doctrine of the Trinity correctly as well too, because um, it just seems like um, a lot of times when you hear this stuff, it's usually straw men. Like a lot of Marcus's questions and stuff were straw men, you know, it's things that we just don't even believe, you know, or just misunderstanding how we believe it. So that's why I like these kind of conversations to try to help flesh that stuff out. Um, there was some stuff he did say in the beginning of the video that we didn't play. Um, he did say, um, he said that he, well, Peter and Paul disagreed 
Um, so, and he's like, these are the people who wrote the Bible. He was saying, he said, Peter and Paul disagreed. So therefore right. we can disagree on the Trinity and it's no um, big deal there, um, kind of like too. And um, I don't know what he's talking to when he talks about the disagreement. I, I don't think he's talking about the Galatians disagreement, right? Um, because yeah, then in Galatians, saying, they, they agreed, right? Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. The disagreements would not be concerning the nature of the Godhead, the person right. of Christ, because Paul himself is quite clear in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 4, that Satan, the serpent, will try to seduce you in order to lose your spiritual virginity, because Paul likens the Corinthians as a chaste virgin daughter betrothed to Christ as a husband. So Paul is saying, make sure when your husband comes to consummate the marriage, obviously it's spiritual, it's not physical nature, that you are a spiritual virgin and he hasn't seduced you. And he says, this is how Satan tries to seduce us to lose our spiritual integrity. If someone comes and preaches another Jesus from the one we preached or presents a different spirit from the one you received or a different gospel, you put up with it easily. The last thing that Paul would do would be to dis agree to disagree on the nature of the Godhead, the person of Christ, the work of the Spirit, and the gospel. Because he says those are the areas that you need to safeguard because those are the areas that Satan will attack in order to deceive you and damn you and destroy you. So make sure you got Jesus right, you got the right Spirit, and the gospel right. So that's, that's right. not something that Paul would simply agree to disagree with Peter. I'm sorry. Yeah, and Peter agreed in Galatians, right? So Paul yeah. rebuked them, and then Peter agreed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and that's the same Galatians, John, that says, if we are an angel from heaven, should preach a right. gospel other than that we preach to you, let him be anathema. There that's are right. secondary issues that that's we right. can agree, disagree. But when it comes to the God, because Marcus is not disagreeing with us on a secondary issue. He's disagreeing with us on an essential doctrine. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the spirit? And what is the gospel? That's right. Those are not secondary issues. Those are non-negotiables and are damnable if you're wrong. So um, here's a, another thing, too, is because I see comments in here. And also on his video, he says over and over, he says, these people say that I'm, I'm not really saved, blah, blah. He says that um, people don't see the fruits in my life. And then there's some commenters on here saying, you guys don't see the fruits in his life. Um, me and Sam were actually talking about this prior to the stream because I'm going to be teaching on Matthew 7, 15 uh, through 20 here soon and, uh, and then 20 to 25. But uh, in Matthew uh, 15 through 20, um, Jesus, this is the passage where people get to where they say you will know them by their fruits too. But yeah. fruits there does not refer to outward appearance. This is what people have to understand too, because if you, if you think that you can judge um, if somebody's a Christian or not slowly on um, the way they act, people can act good with bad motives. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says to the Pharisees that the inside of the cup is dirty and the, I mean, the, uh, the outside is clean, but the inside is dirty. Um, but the passage there too, he's referring to the wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Um, sheep's clothing looks good on the outside. That's not the issue, right? Um, but inside they're ferocious wolves, you know? And so um, what I think that the passage there is saying, and I can make an argument for it if we need be, but the passage there is not talking about actions or um, this external stuff as the fruit. Instead, it's talking about the words and the teachings too. And this lines up with like Deuteronomy 18 um, and all these other passages in, in the Old Testament stuff is how you determine if a prophet is a true prophet or not is based off of what they teach, not by how good they look. You know, it's that those aren't, that's not what you're supposed to be looking at. And I think that's a consistent narrative through the Bible. So um, Sam, what do you think about yeah, that? In fact, I'm going to just confirm a point you're making uh, by showing you that Paul, again, 2 Corinthians 11, look what he says about ministers of Satan who have been deceived and deceived. Look, watch, watch. See, this is what's beautiful about the Bible, folks. The Bible is truly the word of God. It is the voice of God, and it has answers to all these questions, even though you may not like the answers. Now, watch this, John, and you know this. I'm preaching to the choir with you, but notice what he says. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now watch this. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, John. Yeah. You see what he said? That is one way that Satan disarms you and deceives you into embracing these ministers of the devil. Satan will work in them in such a way to appear humble, to appear <clears throat> compassionate, to appear holy, to appear spiritual, but that's the facade because Satan himself appears as an angel of light. I don't care how many times a day he prays. I don't care how many times in a month he fasts. I don't care how much money he gives to the poor. I don't care if he is keeping himself sexually pure and denying himself. That means nothing because that is a facade that Satan will use to disarm people into buying his false God, his false Jesus, his false spirit, and false gospel. 
And we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. Glory to the triune God. Yeah, amen. And, and so you guys know, too, that passage in Matthew um, 7, 15, or it's actually probably uh, 7, 18. But in that passage there, too, it's actually given the conditions that determine a false prophet, too. I mean, that's the whole thing, too. So prophets are going to be judged off of this. This doesn't say Christians. Um, you can know face Christ, fake Christian based off of knowing them from their fruits in this passage. It's talking about false prophets, too. And the false prophets is coming from their teachings. So if that's the case, that's how you determine if you actually believe Marcus or not, if he is a false prophet or not. It's going to be based off of the teachings that he gives, not based off of his outward appearance or those kind of acts. And, okay. and the only reason I say that is because he actually claims to be a false, I mean, claims to be a prophet. Not too many people claim to be a prophet, right? Um, but he claims to be a prophet. So the Bible gives all kinds of conditions and criteria, um, judging them by their teachings in order to know if they're actually truly a prophet or not. And, and John, to confirm, that's what Paul's point is, 2 Corinthians 11, they're teaching. Yeah, that's right. That's it's right. They're teaching. What yep. do they teach about God, Christ, the Spirit, and the gospel? So it's confirming what you're saying about Matthew. That's right. Um, another super chat from Zandi. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. It says, how to answer them when they say Jesus said, I am, oh, I and the Father are one. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, somebody paid Mar Marcus. Or I think she's I think she's asking, yeah, how should yeah, you? How they, they bring it up? That. Because, man, I would love yep. when a modalist brings up that passage because that again you know what actually folks don't take my word for it you know what the greek says that verb are i and the father are one the verb are is esmin it means we are one it's more than one person we are one so i don't understand how you're going to quote a verse where jesus says the father and i we are one we're not one person we it's plural it's not singular. The Greek is esmen. It means we are, showing they're not the same person. But then to make it even worse, remember, according to certain strands of modalism, and you said that Marcus on one show said that Jesus is the human manifestation of the Father, the Father in human flesh. Okay. That means you have a human nature doing divine works. Because in John 10, 27 to 30, pay attention to what Jesus says. John 10, 27 to 30, he says, my sheep know me and they hear my voice. I, this is the human Jesus now, I give them everlasting life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I, the father, we are one. So now, according to Marcus's view, this human nature is doing the works that only God can do. So a human nature, a human manifestation is doing the works that only God can do because only God gives everlasting life. Only God guarantees the everlasting preservation of the flock. So you have a divine person and his human manifestation, human nature, doing what only God can do. How does modalism make sense, especially in light of this one passage right here, John 8, 17, 18? This one, for me, ends it. Modalism is over with. John 8, 17, 18. Jesus speaking again. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two men... The, the Greek word is anthropos, the plural. Two men is true, meaning two persons, not flesh and blood men. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. John 8, 17, 18, Jesus says, I'm going to meet the conditions of the law. The law says you need two men, different, distinct men, bearing witness. I'm one person, one man, and my father is the other person. But John, last time I checked, Modalism deny that Jesus is a distinct person from the Father. Jesus is simply the human nature of the Father. So this is one person testifying in two different modes. So was Jesus lying that he is a different person from the Father, qualifying for two independent persons testifying? Was he lying? Nah, he wasn't lying. All right, then that means the modalist <laughs> is a lie. That's a lie. That's, right. That's right. Um yeah, I was, yeah, I was, there's a bunch of passages. I think the book of John too, and it, you have all these passages, like at Philippians 2.17 and 1 John 1.1 1, 1 for 1 John 1.14 and then 18. Um, you have all these passages, or even John 17, right? The chapter of John 17. I, I just don't see how modalism can stand up in, in right. the face of these scriptures. I, I just don't see it. Um, another question from that same person, uh, the same, uh, I'm taking it maybe modalist, um, says uh, the prep in Greek, um, doesn't change the fact that Jesus' name is only so you notice. Uh, is the only name associated with baptism in Acts 17, uh, or in Acts. I'm sorry, in Acts. Uh, James 2 7, Jesus' name was invoked. He put in quotes. Many Trinitarian who, commentators recognize this is Jesus' name at baptism. 
Okay, now who doesn't, who denies that Jesus' authority would be invoked in baptism? Notice he's still not getting the point. He's assuming the name is like, hey, my name is Tom. I don't know how much clear I can make it. The word name can also refer to the characteristics or the authority. Of course, they're going to invoke the authority of Jesus to baptize. John, in other words, when you say to me, hey, Sam, why should I got baptized? Because Jesus authorizes me to come. That's what it means. I mean, John, I thought I was clear the first 20 times. Yeah. Right? yeah. But now notice how he does a backpedal with the who appealed to the Greek preposition, me or him? He did. But now when I said, is it the same preposition? Well, it doesn't matter. So then why are you appealing to Greek? <laughs> oh, because it's all Greek to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Um, that was from Jennifer LaFontaine. Uh, Thank yeah. you for the super chat. It says, I prayed about this the other day to respond. Here's the answer. I confirmed with the Holy Spirit. All members of the body are of the body Godhead. Okay. Well, you don't need to respond to that. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't even understand what it meant. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Same, uh, another one from her says, um, each has a role. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Jesus prayed to God both the night before crucifixion and spoke to him while on the cross, the Holy Spirit was sent after Jesus's resurrection. Oneness and modalism are not the same thing. Okay. Did, did you follow that? I have no idea because typically we use the word oneness in reference to modalism because yeah. oneness means the person is one, the, but the modes are different. So what's the distinction? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was wondering too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jennifer, if you, if you want to put the, the distinction there, why, um, why they're different then um, yeah, then I'll, I'll try to find that. Yeah. Um, so guys, um, we are going to be wrapping up here soon, here in a moment. Um, before we do, so um, while, while waiting on Jennifer and also Sam, can you point us though, uh, I know you've already talked to, um, tonight too about the Trinity in the Old Testament. Do you have any other one that you'd like to kind of discuss real quick? Uh, you mean from Old Testament? for the Yeah, from Old Testament, okay. yeah. What I want people to do, I want them to read, just because again, time is winding down. I want you to take a moment to read Genesis chapters 18 to 19. Just read it all the way through. You're going to note it says Jehovah appeared to Abraham. He saw three men. Now, if you want to deny that all three men are the members of the God, that's fine. Put it aside. But one of them is definitely Jehovah. He's on earth in human form. And then Genesis 19, it says Jehovah, who was on earth, went down to Sodom. And it says he brought fire and sulfur from Jehovah out of the heavens. Genesis 19:24. So you have Jehovah on earth in the form of a man, bringing fire and sulfur from another called Jehovah out of heaven. Last time I checked, that's two. But the same Old Testament tells me Jehovah is only one. So it can't be two Jehovah gods if there's only one Jehovah God. But then this shows that that one Jehovah God is not one, one person. He's more than one person. And to further add to the point, when Abraham's talking to one of those men, <clears throat> And he realizes it's Jehovah God appearing as a man face to face. In Genesis 18, 25, he says to him, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Far be it from you to treat the righteous as the wicked. Far be it from you shall not. Now notice what he says here. Something powerful. So it shows Abraham's aware. This man is not a man. He's God appearing in human form. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And then Jehovah responds. He goes, for the sake of 50, I'll spare it. You're right. There are 50, I won't destroy it. Now, notice the giveaway. Abraham says that this man standing before me is Jehovah, the judge of all the earth. That same Jehovah went down to Sodom, brought fire and sulfur out of another called Jehovah in heaven. Then we go to John 5, 22, and we tie it in with the Old Testament. And Jesus says, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. So let's do the math. Father is not the son. The son is the one who does all judging. He's the one who judges on behalf of the Father. You have a Jehovah on earth as a man, and he judged Sodom worthy of destruction, and he brings fire and sulfur out of someone else who's in heaven, who's called Jehovah. That sure sounds like you have glimpses, explicit glimpses of God's multi-personality, the Trinity in the Old Testament. Awesome. Um, very good. Hey, uh, so Jennifer did a follow-up question. I think she's saying that the distinction is um, that um, modalism says that Jesus was born of a man and was not God until he was baptized. And I think she's saying oneness don't believe that because they believe Jesus is fully God. 
Yeah, I no, not no, not necessarily. There are people who call themselves modalists who would still say that Jesus is the human nature of the Father from conception. I think she's using the terms in a more strict sense, whereas we're using it in a more broader sense, right? Right. right. Because now the view that she's articulating, modalism, Jesus is a man independent of the Father, whom the Father indwelt or made divine at baptism. Because gotcha. that's, uh, that's what I'm getting from what she said, that okay. Jesus is a man who had baptism became God. Well, that, that would, in one sense, yes, it wouldn't qualify as modalism in that it's not simply Jesus as the mode of the Father, but a human being indwelt by the Father. So in that sense, I see why she would say that's not modalism. However, with that said, <clears throat> when I'm talking about modalism and oneness, I'm talking about those who say there's one person who appears in different modes. So oneness, our modalist, even though maybe <clears throat> this particular branch that you're articulating, do not believe Jesus is a mode of the Father, but still, nonetheless, I'm talking about modalists who are oneness because they believe the Father is one and different modes. So that's how I'm understanding it. Gotcha. Cool, cool. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be clear what she's trying to say, but yeah, she is right. There is a group that are oneness that believe Jesus is simply a man and dwelt by the Father, which is even worse. That's Unitarianism. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, this uh, super chat from Nadia Verse. Thank you for the super chat. It says, great live stream, John and Sam. Two quick questions for Sam. One, are you the Syrian Bruce Lee? Man, <laughs> Bruce Lee, that would be a joke on you. That means because I'd be the greatest apologist who ever lived, untouchable. <laughs> that means the Chuck Norris of apologetics, David Wood, would be just, you know, <clears throat> eating my dust. <laughs> hey, when we were in New York, we had food at Bruce Lee's. Was it his sister? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the story, guys. You don't know. You don't know this, but David Wood found the location. Yeah. Angela Mao Ying, who played Bruce Lee's sister in Enter the Dragon, sure. where she gets she commits suicide rather than have Bolo, not Bolo, O'Hara, Bob Wall defile her. She's in New York and she owns a Chinese restaurant. She's retired. She's in New York. She has a Chinese restaurant. She's the one who played Bruce Lee's sister, who met Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. And when we went there to find her, the, her husband came out and said, oh, she's on vacation. I go, oh, how convenient. She <laughs> went on vacation without her husband. I wonder why. Why did she leave you behind? <laughs> and the second question is, are you single? Some ladies might want to know. Listen, I'm single, ready to mingle, and I'm the most gorgeous Assyrian apologist that I know. <laughs> today. So don't hate, participate. <laughs> That's right. Well, on that note, guys, we are going to wrap up. Um, so, you, you know, Sam, first off, man, I love you, man. It's always good to see you. I always miss you, man, when, you're, when we don't see each other for a while all the time. So I'm and glad I, to have you on, man. I just want to say something, and I mean this, and I've said it to people. Even though I banter with David Wood, John... David Wood, Anthony Rogers, Adam Coleman, vocab, my family for life and forever. I love these brothers for the sake of Christ, and I'm willing to die for them. And that's how much I love them, and I love you, John. You are a warrior for Jesus, man. Appreciate that, bro. Yeah, man. We love you too, of course, man. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get you back on another time. So you guys too, like, let me know too in the comments after the video is done what you guys would like to hear Sam talk on another time or something, and then we'll, we'll set something up here in the future again. So um, Sam, before we go too, where can everybody find your work and your channel and all that stuff. So. Thank you. I'm, my channel is called Shimunian, but I'm infamous for blocking people. I don't have the patience and love of John. <laughs> in fact, we're going to come up with a t-shirt saying, I was blocked by Sam Shimun. That will be your badge of honor. <laughs> I, I try to live stream daily if the Lord Jesus permits me. And then I have a blog called Answering Islam blog.wordpress.com. I'm updating it daily, if not daily, at least twice or three times a week. And just go there. You have my permission to download this stuff to your website, YouTube, use it, disseminate it for the glory of Jesus Christ and pray for the provision that we can continue to do this work for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, anything else I'm forgetting, Sam? Anything, any other words, last words, anything else? Just one thing. Do pray for my two daughters. I have two princesses from Jesus. Pray God will bless them and that I can be Jesus to them, raise them up. And one thing I want you to remember, if you let the Bible speak, and I want to leave you with these words. And do not put God in a box. Even a blind man can see from Genesis to Revelation, the one true God is triune. He is three eternal persons, three eternal relationships, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And one of them became flesh, and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
believe in that God, trust in that God, love that God, worship that God, your only hope of salvation. Amen. Hey, man, well, Sam, uh, <laughs> David would said after I read that one question, he said all the girls in the chat just threw up, he threw up in their mouth a little bit. <laughs> God, I hate it, dude. There goes my back. Oh, my back. <laughs> <laughs> you were just talking about how much you love the guy. You see how he repays you? <laughs> because he's a Chuck Norris wannabe and I'm Bruce Lee. He'll eat my dust. <laughs> 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 all right my brother good to, good to see you my man and um yeah we'll, we'll do it again next time man so thank you guys all for the super chats thanks for hanging out with us but sam the next time that people try to say that there's only one person in god what, what are you gonna say i'll say even a blind man can see the father is not the son the son is not the spirit the spirit is not the father and jesus himself said i and the father are two persons so either he lied or your teaching is not scriptural repent and turn to the true god your only hope of salvation. And you're supposed to say, what do you mean, son? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, buddy. <laughs>